Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for joining me for a new video. Today, I'm here with Dustin Heiner from Master Passive Income. What's up, Dustin? Hey, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me on the show, man. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. So me and you, like, we got connected by uh, somebody who basically cold emailed on your behalf and said, hey, Dustin loves making passive income. Do you want to have him on your show? And I said, absolutely. I love talking about passive income and learning new things from new people. So I'm excited to have you here, man. And uh, the first question I usually like to ask guests is, let me know a little bit about your background. Like what got you started with your um, passive income endeavors? Yeah, yeah, I love passive income. In fact, I we're all taught growing up, we need to do active income. That's where you work one time, get paid one time, which is just horrible. It's much better if you work one time and get paid over and over again. So let me quickly jump to the end, but then I'll go back back to the beginning of okay. how, how what really got me into it. So when I was 37 years old, I was blessed to be able to quit my job. And it's because I had enough real estate, rental properties, basically buy and hold real estate that made me money without working. And that's why I call it mastering passive income. Master passive income is because I buy one property and it makes me, it makes me money over and over and over again. And I literally give these properties to my kids, so I don't have to sell it at all. But yeah, so when I was 37 years old, I was blessed to quit my job. But let me quickly go back to the beginning. And I really got to tell you the story of what really shoved me, like just, just ripped me out of my what I was doing, got me into passive income. So um, all growing up, we're all taught that we need to basically get active income. And what they do is they tell us, okay, you go to school, you get good grades. And then you take those good grades, you go to college, get even more good grades and get in thousands and thousands of dollars into debt. And you take that piece of paper that they give you, you know, a degree. And you go around and you try to find a company to eventually work for, try to get a career there. And they work 40 plus years of your life and eventually retire at 65 years old when you're trying to live off of what you managed to save that entire time. Well, I was doing that exact same thing, but all the while I've always been entrepreneurial, you know, you know, starting businesses, that type of thing. And so when I was young, I was 13 years old, I had a newspaper route. That's where you ride on a bike with bags of newspapers and throw the newspaper at 5 a.m., banging them on people's garage doors, waking people up. I had had a graphic website design company. I had a skateboard manufacturing business. I even had a pizzeria and a convenience store. Like all these businesses started from scratch. So they were doing well, but they weren't doing well enough for me to not work for somebody else. So I was doing a regular nine to five IT job. I was working for the local county government in California doing IT work. And I also bought one rental property at the time. And when I bought that property, I said, oh my goodness, like I don't do anything. And I remember that first check that I got that first month after the rent came in and after all the expenses, it was like $317. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I just need more of these. And I knew I wanted to be an investor, but like happens for everybody, life just started getting in the way. And my wife and I started having kids. Eventually we had our fourth child. And this is the story that really just shoved me into becoming an investor and getting into passive income. So we had our fourth child. I was still doing a regular nine to five sit down desk job. And when uh, my wife had her fourth child, I went on paternity leave. That's where the dad stays home with the mom, changes poopy diapers and bonds with the baby and all that good stuff. And then I went back to work. And that week that I go back to work on a Friday at 3.30 in the afternoon, I get a call from my boss's 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 secretary, like the, the top dog. And I, I said, hello. And she says, Dustin, would you please come to the office? And I said, sure. And then I hung up the phone. And then I, saw, I thought for a second, why are they calling me in the office? Like, this isn't normal. And I've seen plenty of movies, like getting a call from the boss's boss's boss at 3.30 on a Friday. It's not good. And right. then I started remembering about two months before I went on paternity leave, there was some rumors or some rumbling going on in the county or in the department that there could potentially be layoffs. And I really, I was like, no way. I shook it off. I said, there's no way. I, I've worked here for many years. I got lots of seniority. My bosses give me raise all the time. I do a good job here. So I shook it off and I get up and then I walk to my boss's office and I start walking down the hallway. Now, Ryan, this hallway isn't very long. In fact, it's, it's kind of short. But every single step that I take, it feels like the hallway gets longer and longer and longer. And it feels like my feet become lead bricks because the weight of possibly losing my job is just crashing down on me. Well, as I get down the hallway, I turn the corner and I see my boss's door. His door is closed. I look at his secretary, super sweet, nice old lady. And she says, Dustin, would you please have a seat? And she's Grin, you know, sheepishly grinning at me, kind of consoling me with her eyes because she knows everything about what's going on. I know nothing about what's going on. And so I go and take my seat. And as I sit there, I start thinking about my life. And my goodness, that plan that they told me that I had to do, get a career and everything I just shared with you, if that's all taken away, like if I lose my job, 
does that make my life a waste? Did I waste my life doing this? And then I realized, my goodness, we just had our fourth child. If I can't provide for my family, what does that make me as a father? Does that make me a failure as a father, as a husband, as, as a man trying to provide for his family? Well, as I'm sitting my hands get all clammy, my forehead gets all sweaty because the nerves and everything is just crushing down on me. Well, the door to my boss's office opens up. Out walks a lady, a coworker of mine with a piece of paper in her hands. She is noticeably distraught, noticeably upset. She's not necessarily crying, but you can tell her world's absolutely been rocked. She passes by me and my boss says, Dustin, would you please come in the office? So I get up and I go into his office and I get laid off. And remember, this is the government. Nobody gets fired or laid off from the government, right. but I did. So if it happened to me, it can happen to anybody. So I go back to my desk with that layoff notice and I sit down at my desk and I realize two things. And this is why I tell the story. I realize two things sitting right there in, in my desk. First thing, I need to get another job. I need to find a way to feed my family. Like, oh no, I can't feed my family. So I was really, really blessed, praise the Lord, to find another job in the same county whole different department. They weren't having the money issues. So check, I did that. But the second thing, the reason why I tell those stories, the second thing that I realized sitting in that chair was that I needed to make sure that this never, ever happened to me again. I need to make sure that nobody had the ability to take away my ability to feed my family. So right then and there, I realized whenever anybody would ask me the question, Dustin, what do you do? And we all get this question. What do you do? I would reply, oh, I do IT work for the local county government. And I'm basically projecting my value as being in my job. No, my value doesn't come from my job. My value comes from my God, from myself, and from my family. And same thing for you. What you need to realize is that your value is so much more than your job. In fact, your boss is not paying you what you're worth. And you'll know this for sure, for a fact. Your boss is paying you just enough to keep you working without quitting, but not so much money that's taking money out of their pocket. So if you got paid with what you're worth, you would be paid so much more, they go out of business. So let me quickly fast forward the story. Once I realized that my value doesn't come from my job, I said, because I knew I needed to be an investor. Remember, I bought that one property, but life got in the way. And I said, from now on, I'm going to tell everybody I'm an investor. It may so happen that 100% of my money comes from my job. That's now my part-time job. I'm a full-time investor. Fast forward the story started buying property after property after property, each one in passive income, making me $250 or more. Some were making me $350, $450, and $500 a month in passive income. Eventually, I had 30 plus properties. And I realized, man, even though I'm making $75,000 a year at this job, I'm losing money. So round up the story by saying, I went to my new boss after I had enough properties. And I said, hey, boss, here's I'm laying you off. Here's your layoff notice, you know, two-week notice as a joke. And he said, Dustin, what are you going to do? I said, well, I don't have to do anything. I literally own real estate that works for me without working. I make money passively and I don't have to do anything. So the last part of the story is, if you remember that short hallway that I walked down to my first boss, I walked away from my job the very, very last time. It was a mile and a half walk. I walked, I worked in downtown. I didn't want to pay for parking. I'm too frugal for that. So I walked this walk a thousand times. I felt like I was walking on clouds because I knew I would never, ever need a job again. So everybody needs to realize this. If it happened to me, it can and probably will happen to everybody. We need to be prepared. And I suggest passive income so that we make money without working. We work one time and we get paid over and over again. And if you do that, you'll be prepared for this. And then hopefully you'll even get passive income enough to where you're financially independent. And you could literally go and lay off your own boss. So I'll pause the story because you probably got plenty of questions. No, man, that was great. Thank you for sharing. It's definitely like motivational, inspirational. Um, I can relate to just about everything you said there, man. Uh, I worked myself out of a job as well. And, uh, you know, what's funny is like, I have this free course on my website, ryansmethod.com. And like, if you enroll in any of my paid ones, it's like the first link is to go to the free one. And just, and like in that free one, all I try to really do is like instill a little bit of like a different mindset about like life in general, the kind of like life plus finance and like what role does finance play in your life? Cause like you said, man, it's like, I think too many people <laughs> derive their value from the, you know, the number that they are mm -hmm. told they're worth at a job. And it's like, it, what is the number in the first place? You know, do a little research into dollars. What is a dollar? What, what value does that hold? We, we just watched the buying power of a dollar get wiped out in the last Absolutely. two years through no fault of our own, right? Through, through, you know, so anyways, I can go on those rants forever and ever and ever. But <laughs> I can too. <laughs> I, I love, I love where you're coming from, man. It's like, I think we see things very, uh, very similarly. And um, that was a great story. So I appreciate you sharing.
Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the great thing about real estate investing is for me, after I saw this, I knew that there was a way to do it. Like there was a way out or a way to protect myself again. And that really just changed my life because we're all taught this. We're all taught to go and work actively, basically making active income. So much better making passive income. And it took that to change my mindset. It took that to really get to wake me up. And what there's a saying, I love this saying, so a smart man learns from his own mistakes. Well, a wise man learns from other people's mistakes. So learn from my mistake that I put my trust and what I thought was the most secure job ever, the local county government. Who like, yeah. ever gets fired from that in California and all places? And I am the, actually the case that actually got fired or laid off from that job. And so your job is not guaranteed. Now, people will say when they, I coach a lot of people how to invest in real estate and I myself invest in real estate, I get the question or the thought, hey, Dustin, investing in, in real estate is risky. And I said, well, I get that because I started, it's hard to do something you've never done before, but what's more risky in my opinion, and I'm like literally the outcropping of that risk getting laid off. If you put your risk in some somebody else, somebody else who has the ability to take away your ability to feed the family, your family, then that's going to be so much more risky because you have no control. I personally, because of all my passive income streams from my real estate investing to all of my passive income businesses that I create, I have so much money coming in that no matter what anybody does, in fact, I have multiple streams of income that no matter what, like if my real estate goes down, I still have money coming from my other businesses. If my businesses Absolutely. go down, I have my real estate. And so I love streams of income. But I will say this, I love passive income streams that come in, but they all flow back into my river of income, which is my real estate investing. So they all come in and then flow into my river because that's long-term generational wealth. I'll literally give these properties to my kids. So I love passive income because once you realize you work one time, you get paid over and over again, and you make yourself uh, now, I don't build any business. I don't do anything else that's not passive income now, because once you realize that your life changes. Absolutely. And I feel like there's a perspective shift too. once you kind of go out on a on a limb and like uh, start, you know, start some I, I call it planting seeds when you plant a seed and you start to see the returns from it and you say, oh, wow, I can really do this. Like I like to share the story of when I first started. Uh, we talk a lot about like, you know, selling on Amazon and whatnot on my channel. Um, there's one method particularly that's like very a uh, low barrier to entry with like really high upside called print on demand where we can design T-shirts like the one you're wearing and sell them. And I remember getting into this program called uh, merch by Amazon. And when I would like, you know, early on, I'd be lucky to sell one t-shirt a day and make like two, three, four dollars a day from that <laughs> sale. And I'd brag to my friends like, Hey, like I'm making sales in my sleep. I'm waking up richer. And they're like, how much you make? I'm like, I don't know, $3. And they're like laughing at me. But the joke was on them. Cause I was like, dude, like what's stopping me from turning three into six, six into 12, 12, to 24. And it's completely Absolutely. passive. It's on autopilot. I wake up literally richer every day when I wake up out of bed than I was the night before, like what's not to love there. And like you said too, I can really relate to when you have cash flow, especially right now in like a deflationary environment, like the dollars are gaining strength. What does that mean? It means through the central, you know, central planners and their monetary policy, you need less dollars to buy things that you used to need more dollars to buy, right? They're trying to fight inflation. What is inflation? You need more dollars to buy things. So um, yeah, when you have a cash flow business, other people may feel like the sky's falling because my investments are worth less. It's like, okay, but you have a strong dollar. So if you have cash flow, buy more, right? Like this is why they say average into things. You average on the way up, you average on the way down. They try to weaponize. I don't want to say they try to weaponize, but like, you know how it is. Human psychology almost like works against us when it comes to Absolutely. the fear of losing money. It's like, well, you're not losing money in, a, in an investment until you sell. And if you sell at a loss, what if you just hold it? Like if you have real estate, um, what an incredible investment it's going up in value over time, you know, and it's returning you money from the renters. So I love that, man. I honestly would love to learn more about that too. Um, I definitely have well, some we questions. Could dive in. I, I, yeah, I have, I could literally give you a step-by-step -step because I don't invest for appreciation, even though appreciation is good, meaning you buy it at one price and over time, we just know real estate goes up in value. That's fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I love that. Um, but what I really love on top of that is passive income. That's how I feed my family. I'll quickly, and we can definitely get, I'll, I'll walk you through how to do it, but I'll quickly give you the six ways that I make money 
when I buy just one rental property, let alone the 30 plus properties that I own. No, now. I love this, man. So, Me and my girlfriend, we literally talk, like we keep joking that we're going to buy a parking lot because we can think of so many ways to monetize the damn parking lot. So I, I would, I, I'm loving this, man. We're on the same wavelength for sure. Let's go. Absolutely. I think a parking lot would be phenomenal. You don't have much overhead at all. Anyways, yeah. So the six ways, the first one is passive income. One of my favorite things, you know, you calculate your expenses and then you make sure you can rent it for more than your expenses. That difference is your passive income. I suggest $250 or more in passive income because that's what I feed my family on. That's what hopefully you will too. And so that's my suggestion. So that's passive income. I love that. The next one, equity capture. So because I'm an investor, I don't pay top dollar. I don't pay market value. I pay a lot less. Now it's going to, I'm going to be putting a lot of offers, but there are people that sell price properties for lower than they're worth. So let's say it's worth $150,000, but I buy it for 120. Well, I capture $30,000 in equity right then and there because I offer and I negotiate, I get the price down lower. The next one is market appreciation. We know just over time, the market goes up. In fact, Phoenix, where I live, in the last year, it's been it's gone up like 30%, which is ridiculous, yeah. by the way. But Well, dollar go down too, right? Perspective. I 100%, exactly, 100% <laughs> yeah. agree. So just over time, let's say over a 50-year period, your house is going to be worth more than when you bought it. The next one is forced appreciation. You buy a house, you you know put new carpet in, you paint the walls. You've seen those flipping type of type of uh, TV shows. Mm -hmm. You basically make it better, and it's going to increase the value because what you've done is made it nicer. But it didn't cost like let's say you raise the value by thirty thousand dollars because you did a lot of work. It probably cost you fifteen thousand dollars. So you capture another fifteen thousand dollars in equity. Another one that's fantastic is tax benefits. I love depreciation. It's a big word. Basically, my house, my houses that I buy, it shows the IRS that I make less money. So I just lose, or I, I, I not lose, I make so much more money in general, and I pay less in taxes because depreciation helps me out. Big long story there. So many more tax uh, benefits. The last one, and this one is just almost as good as passive income, is mortgage buy down. You'll get this, Ryan. So I don't pay my mortgage on any of my properties. I don't pay my taxes. I don't pay my insurance. I don't pay my property managers. I don't pay for repairs. I don't pay for any of that stuff. My tenants pay for all of that. And I make passive income, that $250 difference on top of that. So my tenants pay my mortgage. And so give you a quick example, just easy numbers. Let's say you buy a house for $100,000. I know people might say, oh, $100,000. Yes, there's still our houses. It may be uh, yeah. on the coast. I I'm on a list that kind of sends them. They like curate and send them to you through this company called Roofstock. And uh, yeah, yes. there are. There are $100,000 houses. I see them every week. They, there are. So let's say you bought a $100,000 house. And if you live in the area, you can buy a house with an FHA loan. That's 3.5% down. A $100,000 house, you buy it for 3.5%. That's $3,500. More than likely, you can save up enough $3,500. You buy that house. You move into it because the laws is you have to live in there for a year. Then you move out. And then you rent out that place. Now you still owe $96,500, but you don't pay that $96,500. And the interest on top of that, your tenants pay that, plus the taxes, the insurance, the repairs, all that sort of stuff. And the big way that we make sure all this is accounted for, and here's the, the term that I love to share that I want every, if you're gonna invest in real estate, this is what the term you need to remember, is you build the business first. You build the business first so that it runs on its own. Because remember, we want passive income. I don't want to manage my properties. I don't want to answer phone calls at 2 a.m. I want other people to do that because I've built the business so that it runs on its own. Does that, does that all make sense? Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I love the good like fundamental base too before you got, kind of get lost in the weeds too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Processes, absolutely. Get everything in order, right? Yes. So you're teaching everybody so, how to do yeah. this at, at Master Passive Income? Yes. And so funny story. So I started investing back in 2006 and this was before the crash in 2008. I just bought one property and then, then bought another one and just kept buying more and more. And eventually I was quitting my job and I was like pretty proud of that. I'm like, Hey everybody, I'm quitting my job. Like, you know, like about a year out, I'm like, I could quit and I could quit. And I had so many friends, family members, coworkers saying, well, Dustin, how are you going to be able to do that? I said, well, I own real estate. And the second question always came like clockwork. Well, can you show me how to do it? I said, sure. So I started helping friends and family members one-on-one. -on -one. And as I started seeing them buy the first property, then eventually quit their job because they had enough properties and realizing how much I enjoy just talking about this. I mean, it kind of, I'm excited because this is just fun talking about this. I was able to see that what I was able to share was helping so many people. And then once I quit my job, I was like, well, 
I, there was only so many video games I could play. Only so many times I could go to the gym. I had plenty of extra time. And so I wrote a book because I had a lot of people asking me. So I said, hey, here's read this book. I'll literally give it to you. Here's my book. Read it. It'll answer all the general questions. And then you'll have better questions that apply just to you. And then we can coach from there. But yes, yeah, so everything that I have from the, the, the my book, I even have my podcast and YouTube channel where Master Passive Income, it's literally just me giving away all this information on how to do all this real estate investing. Yeah, that's very cool, man. And um, like, this is a great compliment, like for me with the cash flow businesses I run, uh, which kind of evolved, you know, my, my journey started in like late 2016. I was working nine to five and teaching uh, at a local university. But my, you know, what excited me, like if, if I just crossed paths with you at a bar and you wanted to know my life story, like I didn't talk about my nine to five or, I mean, I mean, teaching was cool, but like I, I'm, my mind is on like, oh no, I'm selling t-shirts on Amazon making $5 a day because one day totally. it's going to be, you know, a hundred, $150 a day, you know, $200 a day, whatever. Um, and yeah, man, with the cash flow businesses, as they kind of evolve and eventually, like you said too, you can almost lose money because you start realizing what your time's worth and going to the nine to five at some point just stops making sense and you kind of evolve out of it. But, um, yeah, man, I, I mean, I'm very, I took up like a massive interest in becoming more literate when it came to investing. Like it's always been something I, I, I want to say I did, but I was more like, you know, very passive buy, hold simple stocks and whatnot. And, and from March, 2020 on definitely assisted by the fact that I was working for myself, like working from home. I have a TV like right here that I just like put on um, YouTube videos all day, just learn from really smart people. And uh, yeah, I'm always thinking like, how do I put this cash to work? You know, I've got, I've got the hard part done. I would say to me, the hard part, like getting these cash flow businesses built up and scaled up uh, next, what do you do? And like, I'm a big fan of um, Bitcoin as one thing. I kind of think of that as real estate that I'm going to pass to my future kids. Like I don't have any now, but totally. I definitely like would love to add investment properties to my portfolio. So I was like super interested to take this call. Um, like right now I only really rent out one house. Like I'm only renting one out that I own and it's to friends and family. So it's not even like I'm making money. Uh, I'm honestly losing, you know totally, what I mean? So I totally, can't do it yes. to them. I can't do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, uh, I wanted to ask you too, like it, I actually, I had too many questions. I don't want to keep you forever, but the first one that was really like eating away at my mind was like, when is the right time to be like, a shark in the water. You know what I mean? Is it when uh, interest rates yeah. are low? Is it when they're, you know, kind of inverse, right? Like interest rates low, housing prices high, housing prices high or low interest rates high. Like what, do you have an opinion on that? I absolutely do. So I'll start with this. So there's a quote, another quote that I really, really love is when is the best time to plant a tree? Well, it was 20 years ago. The best nest time Second best time is today. Like literally plant that tree today. Same thing with real estate investing. Actually, anything in general, starting your your your, your Amazon print on demand fulfillment, like anything that you're going to do, if you start today, now there will be times that are better than others. But if you don't start now, let's say, let's say three years from now, that it's the best time ever to buy real estate, but you start planning then when it's the best time, well, you might miss the boat and it's already back up. Or right now is the best time and it's already going back up. We don't know. So the biggest thing that I love to do with all my students is share that it's always the right time to invest in real estate, but not every property is the right property. What we do, like I said, is we build the business and we make sure, well, let, me, let me give you a quick example of what that looks, that looks like. So if we're going to build a business, let's say you're going to start a convenience store, you know, convenience store, candy bar, soda machines and all that sort of stuff. Well, you're not going to sign a lease on a location, open the doors and set a box of candy bars in there on the ground. No, you wouldn't do that. You go out of business in two seconds. What you would do, though, is you'd build the business first. You'd get the gondolas. Those are the shelving units that all the candy bars go on, the countertops, the cold storage, the bank accounts, cash registers, employees, insurance, everything in the business before you buy any inventory. Once the entire business is built, that's when you buy the inventory and put that into your business. Same thing with real estate investing. We build the entire business. Once that business is built, we buy a property. That property is not your business. In fact, some quote unquote gurus that do this in real estate, they'll say you buy one property, that property is your business. No, 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 no. We're investors. We build the business that property is our inventory. Then we put that property into our business. And that's how I was able to scale my business. And I think it was like five or six years, 30 plus properties in five or six years, literally making me enough to where I didn't have to work. But because mm -hmm. I built the business first, I accounted for my expenses. Now, let me quickly give you another quick analogy on reason why 
right now is the best time because literally today, always, if it's 10 years from now, it's always today. The, first, right. the, the day right now that is the one day to do it, but not every property. Let me give you an example of what that'd be look like. So if you're going to buy a candy bar for 50 cents for your convenience store, you know the maximum you can sell it for is a dollar. Well, okay, I'm going to buy it for 50 cents. I most I could sell this for uh, 50 cents on top of that, which is a dollar. Well, I have 50 cents there. Well, what are my expenses? If my expenses are over that 50 cents, then I'm going to be losing money. So I'm not going to buy that candy bar. or I'm not going to sell it for that. So if I have to buy a candy bar for $1.25, but I can only sell it for a dollar, why would I buy that? I'm going to lose money. So I'm going to figure out how to buy these candy bars cheaper. We got to account for all of our overhead, all of our expenses. I'll quickly go through those. And remember when I said build the business, I talked about the convenience store. I'll talk to you about now what it looks like to build the business in real estate. So the first thing we look for, and we invest all over the country. We invest out of state. I love investing in out of state. When I first got started, I was in California. I invest in Texas, Ohio, and Arizona. My students love the Midwest. Midwest is terrific down to the Carolinas, down in Florida. Great properties all over there. And you so ever what do sight we unseen? Do, oh, 100%. Okay. Just, well, I just well, wanted to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that question because I will say my first property back in 2006, I was so nervous. I had no clue what I was doing. I didn't have any teaching me. And so I flew there. I read, I stayed there for two days, whirlwind of seeing properties. The first property that I bought was the only one that I've ever seen before they buy them. I've been to state or I invest in cities and states that I don't even go to. I've never been to. I, I won't ever care to because I start a business and I have people that live there that want to buy my inventory. Like in a convenience store, it's going to be, like let's say a thousand uh, you know different chips and candy bars, I may hate the taste of like 99% of them and like a couple, but I'm not the only one that's going to be eating them. I have my customers. They're the ones that are going to live there in the real estate or buy the candy bars. So when you're looking at investing in real estate and building your business, what we do is we find a city anywhere in the country, out of state. I don't fly there anymore. In fact, my students, I've got thousands of students now that we rarely ever, like, sorry, my students rarely ever fly because they don't need to. But what we do is we build the business and we find the experts who are there on the ground. Like Zillow's not an expert, uh, Tr Redfin, Trulia, even Roofstock. Roofstock's good, but they're not the expert. Who are the experts? They're literally the people that are there on the ground, your property managers, your right. contractors, your insurance agents, your mortgage brokers, the realtors, everybody in the business, you know, plumbers, uh, wholesalers, contractors, uh, roofers, all these people, they're going to be the ones that make sure you do it right. Especially the biggest thing is your property manager. And here's the reason why I tell this. So I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching and group coaching. And I'll show everybody how to find a new area of the country to invest because my goal is not to give them a fish. Like say, here's a city, here's a property, buy it and do that. I want to teach them so that they learn themselves so that they can do without me. That's my goal is that, you know, they know how to fish now. So what we do is we find a, a criteria of the type of city that we want to invest in that has good inventory, the type of properties we want to buy, three bedroom, two bath, 1,200 to 1,500 square feet, the type that everybody wants to either buy or rent. And then once we have a lot of inventory, that's when we go for property managers. And I'll have students that say, hey, Dustin, I found a great city I've, and it looks great. And I already have five realtors sending me deals. And I say, whoa, 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 stop, 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 stop. We do not go with realtors right away. In fact, they're like the last step. What we need to do is make sure that we have people that are going to manage the business, people that are going to help us to buy like mortgage brokers and things like that to be able to buy these properties. Because if you buy a house and you cannot find somebody to manage that property, either you got to manage it or it's going to right. be a bad property. and It's no longer an asset. It's a liability. And so I've had a lot of students say, hey, Dustin, I've been trying to find a property manager for this property, but all of them say they're going to get shot in that area. So they're not going to manage the property. I'm like, oh, then you bought the bad property. And then they come to me and then I coach them on how to do it right. And then we actually build the business. And instead of having liabilities now, we have assets. And the business is the thing that owns the assets, which is the inventory. And then now we make money by other people doing all the work. Does that all make sense? Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I was going to ask you actually too, because I 100% I agree. and. Um... Like what, what's going through my mind as you're speaking to this is like, I only know what I know. I know that I don't know everything, right? So I don't know what I don't know. And like roof stock was something I, I did go pretty far with, like in contacting people that work there, doing my due diligence. Like I almost bought a place through roof stock just because, you know. Oh, they're I mean, good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying. They, yeah, yeah, good. I got you. 
Yeah. Like it, it, the one benefit there was like, at least they kind of put you in, or, you know what I mean? Like it's basically full service. Like they kind of vet it for you. I'm sure you can't trust them hundred percent, but they do have people like, um, they, you know what I mean? They only have so many areas where they kind of source houses and everyone that's listed through their site has the property manager. So it's like, yes. for me, I'm already busy enough. So it's like, if I can just know that that's there, that, that made me feel kind of good. So do you think like for someone maybe like me who's spread incredibly thin, but has nice cash flow, like that would be an option or do you, it, it like I don't know in your course do you have like a better method that you would stand by that's like oh you know you know you're wasting money if you do it that way or anything like that I would say two things number one the reason why there's a company like rooftop roofstock is because they make money off of investors like you in the transaction and as well as like if there's also a term called turnkey companies where you go to a company they already have the tenants in there they have they already have the property a property manager everything's mm -hmm. set you just buy it from them and just take it over so the reason why there are companies like that is because as an investor, you're you're really just leaving money on the table for them to just take. Let's say these turnkey companies or roof stock. The reason why they do that is because they've already done all the work that you could do that I do as an investor. All the remember the six ways that we capture equity. Like when we buy the property lower than it's worth, they've already done that. They've already captured that equity. You're paying mm -hmm. premium. You're paying almost top dollar for that. And so that's one. You're definitely leaving money on the table. The other one is you're taking somebody else's business that they've already built. You have no idea who this manager is. You have no idea who the tenants are. You have no idea anybody else in, in and around that business. And so it's not that hard to actually do all this yourself. It takes time. Don't get me wrong. It takes time. But once you have that business built, which I love having my business built because I don't work very much at all. In fact, people have heard of the book, The 4-Hour Work Week. Good book and all. But I think working for hour, four hours a week is for suckers. I don't want to work four hours a week. I don't want to work four hours a month. I literally, for my business, all my 30 plus properties, at minimum, or sorry, uh, maximum is 30 minutes a month. All I do is I grab my my mortgage, or sorry, my uh, property management statements, look at them, make sure everything looks good, then put them aside and go back to the gym, go back to play with my kids, whatever it might be, because I have, I've built the business. I've selected the people that I trust. And so the downside with these other companies is, you're getting somebody else that you don't know. Because imagine this, you're building that convenience store and you find somebody on the street and say, hey, you got a pulse, come on in here, manage my inventory, manage my cash, manage my employees, manage my everything, manage my customers, and not really even vetting them out to make sure that they're actually good for your business. What we do though, is we actually do the business, build the business and we interview. Like I'll give you a quick tip or a quick coaching point. Uh, if, you're, if you're gonna hire a property manager, do not just call up one property manager or text an email or whatever a property manager and say, okay, you got a pulse, come on and take my, care of my property. I did that. In fact, I followed what those other quote unquote gurus, they say how to do it. I followed what they said. And within six months, my first prop, my property manager started stealing from me because I didn't do it right. Then I paused and I said, there's got to be a better way. And I realized it's building the business first. So what we do is we interview multiple property managers. I suggest at least four, five, six, seven property managers, and you interv interview them many times. Like texting is not interviewing, email emailing is not interviewing. Um, what is interviewing is phone conversation. Now you probably won't get people locked down to a Zoom call or something like that. They're too busy. Mm -hmm. but a phone call is absolutely an interview. Interview them multiple times, and you'll figure out which property managers, like the cream will rise to the top. Like, do they actually call me back? That's a big thing about property managers. You'll find that property managers don't call you back if they're if they're not good. Uh, next one is trustworthiness. Can you actually trust them to take care of your property? And then experience as well. Communication, trustworthiness, and experience. Can they actually take care of your properties? All the above. And what we do, and so in my membership and everything that I do with coaching people, I have a list of 22 questions and the answers for what we ask property managers, what they should respond with so that our ten, or my, my students know how to talk to property managers, how to get the right information out of them to know which ones are good to hire and which ones are good to pass on. Cool, man. That's great. I love that you have like a formalized approach. That's really what I'm all about too. Um, for me, it's like with my, with my like coaching and uh, courses and whatnot, it's like, I say, start scale and automate your business. So it's kind of like, you know, start slow, face the learning curve. It sucks. Get over that hump, scale it out, still do it manually. That way, you know, the nuts and bolts and then know at the end of the tunnel that you can automate just about everything. So I'm with you, man. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely working more than four hours, but, uh, <laughs> 
I, I have a lot of tools that um, replace myself, you know what I mean? That freed up just an incredible amount of time with, uh, with what I've got going on here with like Amazon and, you know, all those other big websites. So systems and, and when you set up systems in any business, every single business that you have, there are ways to systematize it, to put processes and procedures and people in place to where you can remove yourself. I'll give you another example of where I create passive income. So I have a business. So I have lots of students, like thousands of students. And I also have lots of friends with YouTube channels that coach real estate, different types, you know, from um, apartment complex to storage units to, you know, you name it, land investing. And so I have all my students asking for a meetup. Like, let's all get together. We're all friends online. Let's get together. And so I thought, you know what? What I could do is I could actually create a conference. And, I, and so what I did was, I created a real estate investor conference. It's called the Real Estate Wealth Builders Conference, RubeCon for short, all the abbreviation. And I brought all my friends, all like you know, 30 plus YouTubers and podcasters. And we brought all of our communities together and we I created this conference. Now it's obviously my business, but here's the thing. If I would have just done it all myself, I would be working so much. It's just crazy. Doing a conference or an event is a lot of work. It's a crap load of work. But what I did was I hired people so that they literally do everything. It's passive for me and they do all the work. The money goes into me and I flow it out to them because obviously they're my employees. But the day of the conference or days in the conference, I just walk around and have fun talking to people. Everybody else is running around because they're making sure people are where they need to be, make sure the lights are on, all that sort of stuff. I just go have fun talking to people because I've created systems processes, procedures, and people in place so that it's now passive for me. Dude, absolutely. I love that, man. And that's really um, admirable because I'm definitely still guilty of trying to like wear too many hats, you know, be the jack of all trades. And it definitely, everybody has their limits, you know, and um, I found mine, you know what I mean? I used to be a guy that you could not overwhelm with work. I could always just, just get it done, man. If I excel at one Same thing, here, it's man. using a computer and getting stuff done. But I, I've definitely like found my, my tipping point recently. And, um, you know, it's good. Cause that means I'm going to have to evolve like you have and, uh, you know, learn to outsource, learn to trust people, um, beyond just my like automation, you know, software that I, that I lean heavily on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yeah, hey, you Dustin, and I are very man. similar. Yeah. You and Dustin, I, are very similar. I really like, appreciate. Yeah. Good. Oh, I was just going to say that you and I are very similar in that where I can just take on so much. I have a high capacity for lots of work. I pump out a lot of, a lot of work myself, but eventually it comes down to where you realize, man, I could have somebody else do this. Like a good thought is, Hey, would Warren Buffett be in doing this? Or uh, Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs is past now, but you know, like these people who literally have huge businesses, if this, you know, one email, would they be doing that? If they could hire somebody else, they probably would. So I always put that in my brain. Would this person be doing this, this top dog person? If they wouldn't, I'm going to try to outsource that or give that to another job. Absolutely, man. And you, you also like, you hit the, uh, the wall of, you have kids now. So you actually have a, a real reason to like not be on the computer 12, 14 hours a day, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. I really respect the uh, the business you've built though. And um, I definitely look forward to learning more. So guys, everybody watching, uh, if you would like to learn more about Master Passive Income, I'll put the link right there at the top of the description of this video. Or if you're listening to the podcast version, you know it's going to be right there in the podcast I have a free course. Would you mind Okay, you got a free one. Okay. Yeah, I'll literally give it a free course. I'll give it to you so you can get started. If you go to masterpassiveincome.com forward slash free course, all one word forward slash free course. I usually, if you're on a podcast, you're listening to us. You could even text the word yeah, rental, yeah. R E N T A L to three three seven seven seven. Rental to three three seven seven seven. I'll literally give it to you. It'll get you started, and you'll be able to get started and start investing in real estate. That's great, man. Uh, that's also extremely smart for the people that aren't watching the video. That's uh, that's brilliant. So, all right, guys, I will link to everything though in the description for every. Most of my people are on YouTube, so um, you'll find the links in the description. We'll check out. I'll put a link to your YouTube as well, and uh, anything else you think is worth um, dropping a link to. But uh, Dustin, man, we went for thirty eight minutes. Honestly, like if I didn't cut myself off, I do need to go like go meet my girlfriend at the gym, and we were gonna work <laughs> out together. So, but I'm loving it, man. I'm loving like the the vibes, the beyond just the like. Hey, do this, do that. But like, you're, you're passing on the, um, like the mental side of it. You know what I mean? The perspective that I think is foundational to starting really any business. So, um, thank you for your time here, man. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Ryan.